Thank you, Yael. Okay, a pleasure to welcome Rabbi Dr. Benjamin Min Samuels, Rabbi of Congregation Sha'arei Tvila in Newton. And uh, that's it. That's it for the introduction. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention Yael teaches at Matan. I said it. We're not doing real introduction, just like one sentence introduction. Um, uh, Rabbi Samuel is going to talk about uh, how many Hanukkah candles, the development of uh, Halakha in light of, Tal of, of Talmudic interpretation, science, technology, and um, Vakasha. Rabbi Samuels, I think you're here. I mean, I know yeah, you're here. No, I'm, I'm here. You want to okay. make me a co-host? Yeah, I did already. I made you okay. co-host. You can right. take off your jacket and relax, but if you want to be formal, that's also okay. fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi Thank Vakasha. You. Thank you have you, your everybody. full 29 minutes. You can go five minutes over time from, you know, the official time. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining uh, during this time of darkness and anxiety while Israel is at war. And I want to give a yashkoach to Rob Jay and to all of us to join our resources of energy and time for a zechut, for our chayalim and chayalot, for the hope of the return of the chatupim and chatupot, all of the hostages, and may it herald the Hanukkah of uh, light and hope and Yeshuot v'nechamot b'yamim ahem u'bazman hazeh. Ymir Tashem, it should uh, uh, happen. I want to thank all of the previous presenters who uh, really delivered spectacular uh, presentations. I, I, I hope I will merit a, a percentage of their excellence. Uh, but in particular, I want to thank uh, Professor Kohler for his excellent Talmudic analysis of the Sugya and Masachet Shabbat on how many Hanukkah candles and Professor Stephen Fine on the material history of the Hanukkiah, because both of those really are part one and part two of of my of my class that uh, I, I I hope uh, then to move to part C and spend our sp spend our half an hour together on on that part C. Um, uh, just for those who rejoined, I'll I'll review a tiny bit of the the sugya and, and account a tiny bit of the material history, and and then go to my presentation. But the question that comes up is, and I'm going to share the screen. How many Hanukkah lights do we light? per our halachic and folk practice. And so um, the, please give me a thumbs up if you could see the screen. Excellent. Blank screen. Blank not, screen. So not it's, the not, it's not supposed to be a blank screen. <laughs> right, right. We see it, but it's not. That's not Okay, so let me, try, let me try again. Okay, here we go. Share screen. Screen number one. Okay, how about now? Perfect. Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. So the question is, how many Hanukkah lights? And uh, we um, we start with the sugya and Masechet Shabbat. Uh, uh, I have here. I think this is the the Koran uh, Noah edition of the Tanakh. Tanu Rabbanan. The rabbis taught in a brayta mitzvat Hanukkah that the mitzvah of Hanukkah, which is a rabbinic commandment that follows the victory of the Hasmoneans over the, Assyri the Syrian Greeks in 165 BCE, the mitzvah of Hanukkah near Ishuveto is one candle per man and his household. It's a patriarchal structure, a man and his household. Uh, the Hamehadrin, and for those who pursue mitzvot, or for those who beautify mitzvot, uh, that depends on Rashi pursuing mitzvot. We heard that from uh, Dr. Kohler. Uh, Rambam says it means to beautify mitzvot following uh, Hidur mitzvah, the, the concept of uh, beautifying mitzvot and glorifying God through our uh, dignifying uh, our mitzvot through uh, uh, an aesthetic excellence. Uh, is near l'chol echad v'echad, that on each of the nights of Hanukkah, we should light one candle for every member of the household. And then beyond the normal beautification of mitzvah, on Hanukkah itself, we have something unique, which is mahadrin mina mahadrin. Those who are excessively scrupulous in pursuing mitzvot, or those who are excessively scrupulous in aesthetic excellence and, and want to beautify the mitzvah, mitzvah, there is a third layer. And that involves adding a candle following Beit Hillel successively 
for the eight nights of Hanukkah. So on the first night, we start with one. On the eighth night, we start with, we finish with eight candles, not including, of course, the shamash. Uh, and here we come to a structural question in analyzing this Talmudic sugya. And that structural question is whether level three builds off of level two, or it's an alternative path building off of level one. Meaning we have three levels of, uh, of mitzvah practice. We have the basic mitzvah, we have mahadrin, the first level of enhancement, and then we have mahadrin mina mahadrin, a second level of enhancement. And there's just a literary structural question, which the Rishonim analyze, and that asks, does level three build off of level two, or is it an independent path? So if we look at Tosafot, uh, and here Tosafot is credited to the Re, who is Rabbi Yitzchak of Dampie. He lived uh, uh, in the 12th century. He's uh, 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 said to have died in uh, uh, 1185, perhaps the most off-sided Tosafist by name, and his academy produced the most prestigious rabbis of the next generation. Uh, and um, uh, though there was no formal religious hierarchy in Franco-Germany at this time, he was the nephew and disciple of Rab Yaakov Tam, who was the grandson of Rashi and the leading sage of the first half of the 12th century. So uh, both by his genealogical associations and his renowned knowledge and great spirit, he assumed the rabbinical leadership uh, for Ashkenaz in the second half of the 12th century. And uh, the, the re- says it appeared to Rabbi Yitzchak uh, that the Academy of Shammai and the Academy of Hillel only established their dispute upon the principal ruling of one candle per man per household. For there's greater beautification of the mitzvah in that there's greater recognition when one adds an additional candle each successive night or subtracts a candle in accordance with the days entering or going out. However, if one lights a candle per person in the household, even if one adds an additional candle each night, then you will have no idea what night of Hanukkah it is. If you have five people in the household and it's the seventh night of Hanukkah and you light 35 candles, then someone walking by might think it's the 35th night of Hanukkah, which doesn't, of course, make sense. Uh, but uh, there, but if, if you have if you have uh, um, six candles lit, are there three people in the household in the second night? Or are there two people in the household and it's the sixth night of Hanukkah? So if the idea is to publicize the miracle outwardly, then according to the Re, there can only be either a, uh, a path one or a path two of enhancement, but not a building of uh, the third level on the second level, because then people won't be able to notice. So here I have a, a, a graphic to make this clear. I hope to everyone, level one near Ishu Beto, one candle per household. Level two, near Lakola Echad Echad, you have four people in the household, you have four candles. Level 2B, right? Mahadrin mina Mahadrin, a second path of Mahadrin. Mosi Beholech Lipnei Beitilel, you add one light, on the eighth night of Hanukkah, you have eight candles plus the shamash. Everyone walking by will notice that it's the eighth night of Hanukkah. Now, that's not the only interpretation. There is another line of interpretation, which again is the other possibility of structural analysis of this sugya. And that is that level three builds off of level two, that builds off of level one. And this is the Shita Tarambam. The Rambam, uh, you know, says that his preferred interpretation and his ideal practice would be Neri Shubeto, one candle per person, level two, one candle per person in the household, and level three, one candle per person in the household, adding a different light for each night of Hanukkah for those of us who are Ashkenaz and not uh, Edot HaMizrach or, or uh, Yotzei Sfarad. This is our practice, right? We we like, like the Rambam says, one Hanukkah per member of the household. Interestingly, B'nai Ashkenaz follow the Rambam and uh, B'nai Sfarad follow uh, Shitat uh, Tosafot. That itself is a halacha curiosity that you have 
Rabbi Yosef Paro in the Shulchan Aruch, mentioning uh, that uh, the halacha follows the, the position of, uh, he doesn't say the position of Tosafot, he just cites the position that we attribute to Tosafot. And then the Ramah says that our custom is to follow the Rambam, uh, which is the Yeshomrim, the Kolachad, Midnei Abayat, Yadlik. There are those that say that every one of the household should light uh, uh, an additional uh, candle. Uh, and and that is the 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 general custom of of uh, of Ashkenaz in Eastern Europe, of Western and Eastern Europe, which is attributed to the Rambam. So uh, the Bach and the Taz and others note this is a curiosity that you have Ashkenazim following uh, Sephardic Psak and Sephardim following Ashkenazic Psak. There is more to that story than that simple analysis. And the reason for that is I would claim that the, the basic structural analysis of the sugya leads to both Tosafot and, and, and the Rambam. And uh, we have some evidence of uh, the Rambam's uh, uh, position uh, preceding the Rambam, going back at least to the Rif, according to the Vilna Gon. And uh, also, Tosafot's position is cited by other Sephardic uh, uh, Rishonim, uh, although they, they are later than the Tosafot. So the question is, are they just citing Tosafot? Are they uh, have their own independent tradition of interpretation of that sugya, or did they come up with it on, on, on their own? But those are the two practices. Uh, Svarad tends to have one Hanukkah for the whole household, and B'nai Ashkenaz, one Hanukkah per person. So this is, uh, and Professor Kohler uh, elaborated on that with uh, further halakhic uh, uh, analysis. But what I would like to bring to this discussion, conversation, and study is to view this sugya not only through the lens of Talmudic analysis and not only through the lens of material history of Judaica that Professor Fine brought, but to also view this through the lens of the, of the history of technology, the history of, uh, of material history and social history. So if we view this sugya through the, these lenses, well, now we have to uh, expand our consideration of several elements of our practice of Hanukkah lighting. First of all, we, we have to discuss the question of the history of home architecture, the, the presence of courtyards or lack of frontal courtyards. We have to talk about doorways, uh, their size, where they were situated. And most importantly, we have to talk about windows. What were windows like in different uh, places uh, throughout, uh, throughout history? When we hear the word window, what do we think of? We think of, and how, you know, we think of a glass window that's opening to a public thoroughfare. So what is the history of windows? We also have to talk about um, fuel. Right, we know Bamem Madlikim, the Mishnah in the second chapter of Masachat Shabbat talks about different wicks and oils. So we want to know, right, what what were the cost of different types of of, of fuel? What were their uh, uh, efficiencies? Um, you know, and and what were they lit in? That was the social history of the of the material history. Uh, excuse me, the material history of the Judaica item. And um, as Professor Fine pointed out, even though we have from from the the Torah the the physical uh, architecture uh, of the vessel of the menorah, right? It seems like the Hanukkah is a medieval product. There is a claim that a Hanukkah was found that dates from Beit Sheni shortly after Hanukkah. It's housed in a museum in, in, in Borough Park. They said that they'd done carbon dated, uh, dating on it. Uh, it's a unique relic, but it would seem that the proscription of modeling vessels after the vessels in the Beit HaMikdash really proscribed and constrained the, the, the innovation of a Hanukkah uh, until much later. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little unclear. We don't know what we don't know, but what we do know is that the Hanukkah that we have are medieval and late medieval at that 13th century and, and, and later. And then uh, we have to view this uh, not only through the apparatus, but through climate. 
uh, geography. And then we have to view this also through the social history of what was it like to, for Jews to live in uh, Christendom and in the Islamic orbit. Of course, Christendom has a competing winter holiday that occurs every year at roughly the same time, uh, which would create uh, competing religious practices, whereas the Muslim calendar following a lunar calendar uh, has its uh, holy month Ramadan cycling throughout the, the, the year as all of the other Muslim holidays, and there wouldn't be a direct competition between the winter uh, holiday of, of, of Hanukkah and, and Muslim holidays at that same time. So if one looks at uh, our practice through all of these different lenses, it really adds further dimension to the development of our practices. I would like for today to solely look at this through uh, the, the question of windows. Uh, and, and so let me show you what I mean. So where do we place the Chanukiah? Near Chanukah, Menicho al Petach HaSamuch L'Rashut HaRabim. It should be at the entrance, which is closest to the public thoroughfare, Mi Bachutz, outside. Im Abayit Patuach L'Rashut HaRabim, Maniach Al Pitcho, if the house opens to a public way, then place it at the entrance. And if there is a front courtyard, then you should place it at the front of the courtyard facing the public thoroughfare. Why do we do this? Because the purpose is to outwardly publicize the holiday and its miracle. If you live in a loft, and uh, the question is, how many stories are we talking here? Probably only two stories at this point. Later, we're going to have to contend with higher stories, including high-rise skyscrapers today. Uh, which doesn't have an entrance to the public thoroughfare. You have to place it in a chalon, which we're going to translate now as a window. That is closest or outward facing to the public way. And when there is a danger of persecution, when we're unable to perform the mitzvah, place it in on your, your, your dining table, and that's enough. Okay? And then we we have the, the shamash. I'm not going to get into that. So I want to focus on the word halom. Because the word chalon, like the word menorah, or the later development, as Professor Fine pointed out, of Hanukkah, the word chalon is a word that has a continuity of usage from the time of the Talmud until today. However, there's a great variance in what it means. And we find this throughout um, uh, you know, intellectual history, that we have continuity of terminology, but variance in meaning, which makes it very difficult for those of us in a, a contemporary generation to read ancient texts and then decode words that have had a continuity of meaning, but impose our current understanding upon them when they meant something else uh, differently, uh, different in, in ages past. Uh, this is a problem that was identified in the philosophy of science and the philosophy of language. Um, and uh, th this is a, a problem. And, and those who are interested in the history of science and the philosophy of science will often turn to this question of the terminology, continuity, but variance in meaning to try to decipher what is the, the true unfolding of its history. So um, what I want to uh, talk about is chalon, place it in the chalon. When is it possible to place a Chanukiah in a window? Now, many of us today have reclaimed in Ashkenaz, even those that of uh, us who live in a country that has a Christian minor majority, when there's a competing festival uh, of, of uh, a different religion at the same time, of placing our Chanukiah in our windows. And we display both inwardly and outwardly how many nights of Hanukkah is. And because we have a Hanukkiah uh, that, that groups together the number of candles, so it's clear what night of Hanukkiah it is. When we pass by a window with 35 candles, we don't see 35 similar looking candles. We see seven Hanukkiah with five candles each, or we see five Hanukkiah with seven candles each. So because of the, the material culture of the development of the Chanukiah and the di distinction of each Chanukiah and the number of uh, of nights of Chanukiah, it is 
proclaiming, right? Then we could even use the Rambam's uh, position of every person in the household lighting their own Hanukkah uh, uh, with the number of, of, of candles as a device of Pir Sumenisa outside as, as well. But that all depends, right, on the material culture as well as the opportunity. But let's get back to Halo. So this is really um, interesting. Because the word chalon or window really means an opening in the side of the building. And uh, in, in ancient days, people had openings uh, in, in their buildings, whatever their buildings were constructed from. However, um, those openings were shuttered. And during the winter, you usually shuttered those, those windows and you placed uh, fabric or some insulating material in the crevices and the cracks so that you can insulate your home against the, the the cold. If you lived in a colder climate, you would not open your windows except on a very temperate day to air out the house. And if you lived in a warmer climate, then you might open your, your windows. So the idea of uh, plate glass windows where we have an opening uh, to the exterior of the world from our houses that are filled in with a transparent uh, glass that that provides a clear view both inside and outside and outside inside is a relatively modern phenomenon. I came across this idea when I was living to, listening to a book by a, a wonderful uh, author by the name of Bill Bryson. He started out as a travel writer and then he wrote a brief history of nearly everything, which is a history of science. And then he uh, followed that up with a book called At Home, A Short History of Private Life. And he gives a history of home. And he really talks about so many things. What's the hall for? Why do our windows still have shutters, even though we don't use those uh, uh, shutters? Uh, he 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 goes through a history of every room of the house, and then uh, I was listening to it. It was an audible book, uh, uh, but although in, in front of us we we have the the written copy, he he speaks about the history of of uh, of windows and of of glass. And I did a little more research to, into it, and and uh, I bring some of that. So glass making, of course, is a, a Roman invention. It was known in the ancient world, and it continues. Uh, in the medieval period and continues to uh, I I increase. Um, but the glass uh, windows that were created during the medieval period, we really don't have evidence of glass windows before the medieval period, uh, are, are small glass windows, like stained glass windows. Here's a woodcut uh, um, by Pfeffer Korn, uh, a Gentile artist of, uh, of a, a shul in Cologne in 1508. And you see, we have small panes of glass soldered with lead solder to, together, and we have two windows here. Now, lest you don't want to trust a uh, a a, um, a a a woodcut, here is a, a, a photograph of the old synagogue in Erfurt. Erfurt synagogue uh, made history this year because uh, actually a, a, a postdoc uh, at Harvard this year, who is a member of my synagogue, Shamam Levine Waldman. Uh, was part of a team that uh, re used the DNA of the teeth of uh, of uh, Jews who who died as martyrs uh, in a in a, in a in a persecution in Erfurt in the medieval period to do a genetic population genetic analysis of of those teeth. Uh, in and any but without getting into that issue, right? Um, you see very few windows, very small, and the windows that it had again would have been these very small pane glass windows. And when we look to windows through that are depicted throughout that, this comes from a collection of of ephemera uh, from 1654 to the 1860s, right? Shop shopper shopkeeps keepers. You see all again these small pane glass windows. It is only in the 19th century that the technology developed to make large pane glass windows. That was a technology developed in, in, in France. And uh, even before that, windows were so uh, prized, they were considered a luxury item that were taxed twofold. One, you were taxed if you had a glass window in your house. And two, you were taxed by the weight of the glass used in the window. So glass windows that we take for granted as part of just the architecture of our homes really don't come into existence on a mass scale until 
the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and certainly pane glass windows that have uh, large uh, di displays. And, and so if that's the case, then windows really aren't a vehicle of displaying our Hanukkiot uh, uh, until the, the, late, the, the late modern uh, 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 period as well. Now, if you take that into uh, account with the idea that people who lived in geographies with cold climates would not be opening at night their, their shutters to their windows to, to display their Hanukkiot, uh, and that until you the glass boxes that we're familiar with from Yerushalayim, and, until you could come up with that innovation, uh, it's going to be very hard to have external outward displays of Hanukkiot. On top of that, uh, as some have opined, like the Knesset, Knesset Yechezkel writing in Achuva, that Jews who lived in Christian lands with competing uh, uh, holidays were afraid to light outside. And the Ramah mentioned, and, and in a time of Sakana, you put it on Shulchano, your 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 dining room table, the Dayo, and that's sufficient. The Pirsum Hanes goes on the inside of the house rather than the outside of the house. Jews who lived in Muslim countries where there wasn't a competing winter festival, and at times they enjoyed more security, but there were times of security in, in Christendom as well. But the climate also favored the possibility of lighting outside at the entrance of your courtyard or opening your shutters to, to light outside. Then there would be a greater uh, ability to publicize the miracle, not only inwardly, but outwardly. And if you're publicizing the miracle outwardly and you really care about that, then you, you will follow the position of Tosafot, not because it's a better interpretation of the Gemara, but because it more clearly is the best way to publicize the amount of, of nights that Hanukkah has passed. When you're lighting principally for uh, in-house, in, in uh, not outward, uh, then uh, even absent the, the technology of, uh, of, a, of a Hanukkiah, that distinguishes uh, per person how many lights there are, then for the inside of the house, everyone knows what night of Hanukkah it is. Then you focus on each individual's religious fulfillment of the Mahadrin, Mina Mahadrin, of, of lighting their path. So what I hope to accomplish in this uh, brief period of time is just to add another dimension to the analysis of how many Hanukkah lights that builds off of the uh, Talmudic analysis of the Gemara and the Rishonim and the Achronim, uh, but uh, and the the material history of the Hanukkah itself, and then it expands it to not only the social history of Jews and their security in in the West and and in 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 uh, and, and Eastern Europe and Central Europe and and in the Edot Hamizrach and and Sfarad and and Mid Eastern like lands of a better climate and a different, uh, at times, cultural surrounding in Svarad, uh, but also through the lens of technology, here focusing on how the, ter the continuity of terminology of windows uh, actually means different things at, at different times because of the advance of technology. We could do a similar uh, presentation on the production and uses of oil from antiquity until the modern period. And the last thing that I would say is that just as uh, Hanukkah, according to Beit Hillel, is Mosif Baholif Malin Bekodesh, so viewing this sugya through the lens of technology is also a fulfillment of Rob Cook's famous um, uh, saying of Hayashan Yit Kadesh, that the old shall be renewed, Baharadash Yit Kadesh, and the new shall be sanctified. As technology she advances, we find new ways to fulfill halacha in a uh, superlative fashion, a mahadrin, mina mahadrin fashion. And the history of how many Hanukkah lights is a display of this phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if you want to take a 30 second look at some of the quick questions, comments, and have a minute to answer them if you'd like. Yeah, Otherwise, sure. Why don't you read them to me, Jay? Okay, so very quickly, uh, let's see. Somebody's asking why our Hanukkah you have nine candles often. That's, I know Danny Sperber has a whole article about that in his uh, whole volume on uh, Min Hagez, so a whole volume on Hanukkah. Uh, are you familiar with that, Rabbi? It's been a while since I read right, that nine. particular so, uh, article, but... Uh, um, uh, the nine is because of the dual purpose of the shamash, to yeah. provide light and to light from one candle to another. So some people develop the custom. Oh, that's that's why you have actually 10. 
You have eight to light and then two and two extra show machine. But okay, let me just read you the yeah, question. But by the way, that that question, the, the use of an individual candle for shamash as an addition to either Neri Shubeto, the basic level, or or the Mahadran Mina Mahadran also builds off of the question of how much did oil cost, how uh, you know, uh, and 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 the uses of it. So that that does have a function of it. Um, you know, we take for granted we have lots of shamashim in in our overhead lighting, but we still light the shamash uh, even if we turn on the overhead light or some people, right? Right, hundred percent. Okay, so we're asking if you're. Uh... Glass uh, window faces the backyard, so I assume that's like no wind. Okay, I'll let you comment. <laughs> yeah, no. So if it faces the backyard, so there's no benefit in lighting towards the backyard. It's specifically Chalona Patuach the Rishut a a public facing. Uh, um, uh, whether people light in their window facing their backyard, uh, that just may come from uh, again a a the development of a practice of lighting in a window but not understanding the full uh, intent of what lighting in the window is supposed to accomplish. Yeah. Okay. Last thing, somebody just was asking for the author of the book you uh, you showed earlier. Bill, um, oh, it's in the source sheet, which is po posted on the excellent- It's on the website, the, the search website, on the website. But it's Bill Bryson at Home, which is a history of the home. And I also just used uh, some Wikipedia articles uh, there on, on the history of uh, glass making and the history of windows. You could look all uh, that up, um, and um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Rabbi Samuels will be back next Thursday night giving the Parsha here, which is how this whole thing began, actually. But that's a whole other story, and a pleasure. Thank you very much. Always uh, interesting.